This is Tall Tale TV, your podcast for sci-fi and fantasy short stories. The Christmas Commodore by Leslie Heron, a Tyrants and Tea Kettles holiday short story. Chapter 1, The Fat Man. Will you stop touching stuff? Vel let out an aggravated grunt as he reached across the work table and plucked the delicate instrument from Piper's hands. He gave it a once-over before setting it back down where it belonged. Piper shot him a pointed look before letting out a long, overdramatic sigh as she glanced about for something else to train her focus on. The table she was sitting on was hard, and like much of everything else in the shop, was covered in grease. Despite having been offered a room in the grand estate of the High Inquisitor, with running water and a plush bed, her cyborg friend had opted for living in her brother's old warehouse. Even though she had argued against its habitability, he had fixed the gap in the rafters, reorganized the piles of half-finished inventions, and rebuilt the bedroom area. Clearly, he liked to keep busy. Piper returned her gaze to her friend. You know... Me mom says it's not good for you to be out here all by yourself. Vel looked over at her with a raised brow. I've told you before, I'm fine on my own. He swapped out a tool before turning back to his work. I'd actually prefer it. I don't have to ride up and down on those nauseating death traps or worry about getting stuck in some stuffy office all day. But don't you get lonely? Piper watched him fumble with one of the shiny copper plates that made up the exterior of her new prosthetic arm. Vel gave her a flat look as he leaned against the table. How can I, when you're over here all the time? Piper shrugged. It's not like I have anything else to do. She let out a long exhale, conveying her building boredom. Is it done yet? I'd like to see if it works. Vel glanced down at the cybernetic arm. Its construction was a little bit rough around the edges, but between Atticus's ingenuity and Amy's artificial brain, he had been able to cobble together a functioning prosthetic. But an engineer he was not. It was clunky and limited, and not nearly as refined as his own. But at least this one didn't include a myriad of Atticus's ridiculous additions. No one really needs that many corkscrews. He looked back up at her and gave her a slight shrug. There's nothing left to do but have you try it out, I suppose. You ready? Piper grit her teeth and gave a curt nod. She bit back on a pained cry as she felt her new arm connect to her nervous system. The strident tone of agony bore into her as Vel twisted the prosthetic until the last connection port clicked into place. She winced, blinking away the tears in her eyes, and pulled away. Oh, I'll never get used to that. I know how you feel, kid. Vel picked up a rag and began wiping the grease off his hands. See if it works. Piper looked down, focusing on her metal digits. There were only three fingers on her mechanical hand, so this should be a simple task. Or at least, that's what she thought. A frown formed on her brow as she strained to clench her hand closed. It was like trying to twist a rusted faucet with just your mind. But after several long, intense moments, her index finger flexed a fraction of an inch. Oh, did you see that? It moved! She looked back up at her companion with a broad grin. A smile crossed Vel's face. It was no small feat when it came to convincing the mind to cooperate with a mechanical prosthetic. The fact she had even gotten that much was pretty impressive. He opened his mouth to congratulate her, but the sentiment died in his throat as a horrible sound reverberated off the high ceiling. Flocks of feathered creatures scattered at the soul-shattering noise of metal scraping, like a building being dragged along the cobblestone streets. Instead of clapping her on the shoulder as he had planned, he clapped his hands over his ears. What is that? Piper nearly fell off the table in her haste to get away from what she was sure had been an explosion of some sort. What? I can't hear you! What is that? Vel charged the bay doors of his shop, ready to jump into action if needed. 
and reached down, hauling open the massive rolling door just as the screeching sound came to an abrupt halt. He stared at the source of the noise, his jaw falling slack. His guess about a building being dragged wasn't that far off. Piper peered out around him, squinting against the afternoon sun. What the hell is that thing? Vel had no words. He was standing in front of a large airship, hastily slapped with red paint. The tether had been removed and the fins had been replaced with sleigh runners that looked like they were repurposed metal support beams. He let out a groan as his eyes moved across not one, but several giant mechanical hamsters harnessed at the front of the ship. Each one was the size of a small bear with antlers that were just brass pipes bolted to their heads. As he watched, the lead hamster belched out several small bursts of flame. Atticus poked his head out from the ship, his grin reaching from ear to ear. Hey, Vel! He spotted his sister peeking out from behind the cyborg. Oh, hey, Piper. I didn't expect to see you here. Piper pushed her fingers against her temple, massaging away the throb that his arrival had brought. Atticus, what is all this? Atticus flourished his hand along the railing of the ship. It's the Christmas Commodore and his seven trusty rain hamsters. In a grand gesture, he introduced Captain Leon, who emerged from below decks at his queue. He was dressed in the finest Red Navy uniform money could tailor, except his coat and doublet were trimmed in white fur, and he had traded in his fancy tricorn hat for an oversized nightcap. Even his hook had been decorated with festive ribbons and a jingle bell hanging from the tip. Leon flipped the end of his hat over his other shoulder, threw out his chest, and let out a booming cackle. Ho, 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 ho. He glanced over at Atticus before throwing out another ho for good measure. Atticus nodded his approval vigorously. Vel dragged his hand down his face. What are you doing? Unit 2 rolled around from the other side of the ship and lifted Atticus out of his perch, gently setting him on the ground in front of them. We're here to deliver your gifts! He made a spectacle of spying someone up on the roof. Oh look! There's one of the Christmas Commodore's helper elves right now! He's putting your presents down the chimney! What? Mel spun to look in the direction indicated. It must be a Wednesday, he thought. He didn't need to see the man to know it was old Scribner stumbling across the tin roof with his peg leg. Thunk, thunk, thunk. Then he noticed the bag the pirate was dragging, just before a medley of items were sent cascading down the stone chimney. Mel looked inside his shop at the fireplace. It was more like a furnace than an actual fire pit, and was mostly used for incinerating small objects. As the sound of clattering items reached the bottom, several brightly wrapped boxes came tumbling out the open hatch, each one a tiny flaming ball of doom. Oh, crap! He bolted through the doorway, vaulting over various piles of sorted materials in his rush to put out the flames. He grabbed the first sizable cloth object he could find and began smothering the fires one by one. Piper turned her attention back to her brother, lifting a single inquisitive brow. Why is Scribner dumping trash into Vel's shop through the furnace vent? Atticus grinned. It all started about a month ago. Vel was telling me about all the holidays they celebrated back in his world. My favorite one was called Christmas. See, there's this old fat guy who goes around to all the good people once a year, and he shoves gifts down their chimneys. Also, he has a giant red sleigh pulled by something called reindeer. He paused, chewing at his lip for a moment as he pictured the absurdity of a deer made from rain. <laughs> well, I didn't have any of those, but I was able to make some atlas for my hamsters. Atticus reached back into the ship and pulled out another red woolen nightcap and swapped it for his floppy hat. Look, I'm an honorary elf. His grin only widened. And as such, I get to help Leon and Scribner deliver gifts to all the good people of Avis. Lil grunted as he walked back out through the bay doors. 
I think you missed a few key points of my story, kid. Piper looked over at him to see his hands and face were soot smeared, and his beloved red coat was smoldering to ash in his hands, having been used to put out the fires. She bit back on the grin as their eyes met. I've got to slay, improvised on the deer, and Captain Leon made these, what did you call them, Santa hats? Atticus held up his hand and began counting off everything on his fingers. Oh, and Alphonse was in charge of getting the gifts. Unit 2 had to put him in the ship for me. He was too heavy. It was a lot more alcohol than I imagined, but he said people would need it before Christmas was over. Bell suddenly realized why the fires had spread so quickly and made a mental note to thank Alphonse later. Piper moved up to the skiff and ran a hand along the bow of the ship. But why doesn't your ship have any wheels? It wouldn't sound like a death machine and would move a lot easier on the street. Atticus scoffed. The Christmas Commodore's sleigh doesn't have wheels. It wouldn't be a sleigh then, would it? Vel was distracted by the sound of a body sliding off his roof and turned in time to see Scribner, dressed in a horrible green outfit, free fall from the metal planks, hit a ladder, and slowly pivot, crashing into the vacant lot next door. He let out a sigh and turned back to the kid. Yeah, but sleigh runners would move easier on, you know, snow. Exactly, which brings me to my next gift. Atticus whirled around on the spot, looking up at his mechanical friend. Unit 2, please relay the message to Unit FR-057Y to activate the device. Sir, once again I must protest. We haven't finished testing on that invention. Are you sure this is a wise decision? Of course it is. I've worked out all the math in me, Ed, and an 87% chance of success is fine. Atticus patted the tiny arm of his robotic friend gingerly. You worry too much. Unit 2 visibly heaved its shoulders with resounding defeat. As you wish, sir. His eyes began to flicker, a sign that he was relaying the message to his robotic brethren. Silence hung heavy in the air for a moment. Leon let out an awkward, Ho! now and again, and the lead hamster belched a few streams of fire. But nothing else seemed to be happening. Vel was about to ask exactly what this machine was supposed to be doing when the temperature around them suddenly dropped. Avis was close enough to the world's equator that the icy breath of winter couldn't reach them. This meant mild weather, sunny days, and the undeniable sensation that something was wrong as they were bombarded with the sudden cold front. Leon gave a nervous half-chuckle and pointed upwards. Arr, is the sky supposed to be doing that? Following the pirate's gesture, Vel noticed the rapidly darkening clouds. They bloomed and blossomed until small, frozen flakes began to drift lazily from the sky. Atticus couldn't hide the giant smile growing on his face. It worked! He jumped up and down on the balls of his feet and wrapped his arms around his sister. My weather inducer worked! Piper looked at the frozen flakes with abject terror. Why is still falling from the sky? Is that ash? She gave her brother a grave look. Did you set something on fire? Vel actually smiled for the first time that day. <laughs> it's snow. Piper was trying to drag Atticus indoors. What snow? Is it dangerous? Vel shook his head. Nah, perfectly harmless. See? He held out his cybernetic hand and caught a few flakes, showing them off as they melted against the metal plates. It's just frozen water droplets. Colder climates get snow all the time. Atticus pulled against his sister, dragging her back out into the open and began dancing around with her. She couldn't pull her attention away from the sky. She stared up at it in wonder. Warning. Rapid deterioration of barometric pressure detected. Seek shelter. Immediately. Vel blinked at the sudden warning across his vision. He squinted through the flashing red to see the tiny flakes were growing in size and number. We should move. Inside. Now. The clouds, once innocent and fluffy, had started to roil, 
churning like dark waters. Wind cut across the open street, sending the hard flakes of ice into them at high speeds. It nipped and stung at them like a bite of a thousand insects. Vel reached out and grabbed Piper by her mechanical hand and pulled, dragging her and her brother into the safety of his workshop. He didn't need to repeat himself, as Unit 2 had ushered in the confused captain and his bruised first mate. Atticus watched as the sky continued to darken and bit at his lip. The snow was rising and fast. Oh, chest is gonna be so mad! Piper laid a consoling hand on her brother's shoulder. It's okay, buddy. I can handle Chester. But, uh, maybe you should shut off the machine before this snow buries the city? Unit 2 turned to Atticus, his eyes flashing rapidly. I'm afraid I've already been attempting to contact Unit FR-057Y in an attempt to halt the machine, but his response has been, simply put, nonsensical gibberish. I'm afraid he has either been injured or incapacitated in some way. Atticus looked nervous. I suppose that means I need to get back to the college and shut it off manually. Vel looked at the swirling blizzard outside the front doors of his shop. The day had started off so nice, too. He grabbed a tarp off one of his projects and began wrapping it around himself like a poncho, sighing as he stared at the giant sleigh. Oh, damn it. The Christmas Commodore is a holiday short story by Leslie Heron, involving the characters from her serialized novel of Tyrants and Tea Kettles. Check back this Friday for the conclusion. Christmas Commodore, Christmas what? Commodore. I can't hear you. Sorry, what? I can't hear you. Oh, hold on. Whoa. There we go. Sorry, I, I didn't catch what you were saying. I was saying what was you saying? Oh, it was just a Christmas carol. I thought I was supposed to be the Christmas Commodore. Who's this carol? No, no, <laughs> L like a song. Carol's going to sing us a song. No, um, you know what? Close enough. Yeah. Christmas Commodore, Christmas what? Commodore. I can't Commodore, hear you. Commodore.